Hello and welcome to Dartmouth Hitchcock's virtual roundtable series, Heads Up, Coping Through COVID-19. I'm Audra Burns, Media Relations Manager at Dartmouth Hitchcock, and we're continuing our conversation for part two of Overcoming Challenges of Changing Learning Environments. I'm pleased to introduce our panel of experts today, Two of our guests you might recognize from when we very first launched this series last spring, and we're bringing them back. Let's start with Emily Galeva. She's a 2020 graduate of Lebanon High School who is currently taking a gap year between high school and college. Welcome back, Emily. Aaron Silvestri is a senior at Gosstown. Great to have you again, Aaron. Thank you. Dr. Eric Schessler is a pediatrician at Children's Hospital at Dartmouth Hitchcock and is also the president of the New Hampshire Pediatric Society. Welcome, Dr. Schessler. Happy to be here. And Jason Sternisti, principal at Bishop Girton High School in Nashua. Hi, Jason. Hi, how are you today? Great, great to have you. So let's talk about this very important conversation. And Eric, we're gonna start with you. Although most students are back full time right now, they've spent a year either fully remote or hybrid schooling or all the way in school completely. So we've had a mixture of how students are really truly learning. So some kids adapt to changes better than others and some kids learning styles really lend to you know, in-person learning or remote learning. I, I have two kids and they each are being successful in completely different learning styles. So how can kids and families set themselves up for the most success in either learning environment? Sure, I'm happy to discuss. And I actually have the same scenario. I have two kids at home, one of which does just fine on remote learning and the other one really needs to be at school. Um, so, you know, I, I sympathize with those challenges. And I think the answer to some of that question is um, we tend to thrive in routines. And so finding ways to get into our routine, whether that's in a remote learning environment, whether that's a hybrid learning environment, whether that's an in-school environment, you know, making sure to, to keep up with you know, those typical routines, you know, having a consistent bedtime, um, having a good bedtime routine. You know, for example, for teenagers, you know, trying to go from watching a movie, playing video games, you know, streaming online, to immediately asking your brain to follow sleep 10 minutes later doesn't usually work very well. So finding a good kind of calming routine to help you kind of calm down helps a little bit. Um, having a consistent waking time. So with remote learning, for example, sometimes people are like, oh wait, I can sleep in and wake up at 11 and then their whole sleep wake schedule gets screwed up and then trying to switch from in school to hybrid and back and forth can really cause some problems there. Um, and same thing with our eating habits. You know, we sometimes will have different eating habits if we're at home versus we're in school. So making sure that we're eating our three meals a day, having snacks that are there um, and remembering to eat healthy snacks, you know, that, that we want to make sure that we're you know, making smart choices with the foods that we're doing, because the food we eat actually does change how we feel and how well we can focus and how well we can stay on, you know, on, on you know, top of what we're trying to do. Um, and then the other big ones is things like getting outside, getting some sunshine, getting some fresh air, doing some exercise. You know, all this time frame for all of us has been a little bit more stressful. And luckily, um, the two best things to help with various stressors in our lives are free. And it's vitamin D and sunshine and exercise. And we can do those things regardless of what our learning environment is. So making sure to getting into those routines um, and, and, you know, keeping with those with whatever you know, environment we happen to be in. And then certainly, if we're struggling with the actual transition in school, talking to your teachers, talking to your guidance counselors about like, hey, this is what I'm struggling with. You know, the, one of the things schools have done a phenomenal job with is being a little bit more flexible than perhaps they've been in the past. And so being able to listen to like, oh, hey, this kiddo is really doing well in this particular environment. How do we incorporate that in after we've done our transition? So I encourage families to have ongoing conversations with the, the school that they're working with um, so that we can come up with plans that, that works for everybody's benefit. Yeah, that's great advice. And I think the routine portion of it was from the parents' perspective was was challenging because it was, you know, the kids would have the excuse of, well, I don't have to wake up early because I don't have to get on the bus. So I can have more time. And but it, you're right, it's crucial to have that routine. And and Aaron, I mean, you as a high school student, I'm sure you might have struggled with that. It might have been easier to have those late nights. But let's turn to you now. And and you know, high school is really an important time in in a person's life, both academic and, and socially. So what school activities Activities have you missed due to COVID, and how have you and your friends really handled that loss? Oh, I've 
I've missed out on so much and it's very disappointing, but it's nice because there's been a lot of pros and cons to COVID. One would expect more cons, but I think first off, I've grown so much in using technology itself. Before last year, I didn't know how to use Excel. Something basic per se, but now I do. Now I know how to use so many more document styled uh, uses. So I think using the computer being on here has allowed me to type quicker. Now I can type 10 times faster than I did last year. I think a part of this story is that we've been able to communicate more talking to friends than we did before. We are just better at communicating because we don't get to do it as much in school. I think one of the things that I've missed the most are the clubs. I think a unique part of school is joining activities to better the community. And with that being taken away, it's been a real gash in my heart because I'm a big community member. So with all that being taken away, I felt like I've lost part of myself. And that was a huge struggle for me last year. I would go on walks trying to print pretend like everything was okay. And it, it sucked, but a part of this year has been regaining that energy, trying to tell others, hey, we're almost back to where we were. How can we get there? So we have missed out on a lot, but a lot of the energy coming this year now is, let's get back. We can do this. We're almost at the end of the tunnel. A lot of us have gotten the vaccines and I have been a part of the lucky few already that have gotten there. So I'm just starting to be more grateful than I was one year ago today. That's excellent. And I think you touched upon something that was mentioned at part one of this series, which if our viewers are interested, the link will be in um, the comment section of this video and go ahead and check part one. But what they had mentioned was finding the silver lining. And that's exactly what you, you just discussed. You, you turned a negative into, you know, finding some sort of positive. And, and that's great to hear that you've been able to do that because that is so important for us to be able to move on. And, and Jason, from, from your point of view as a principal at Bishop Girton, you know, how has BG helped students feel like they're getting the normal high school experience despite the changes that um, Aaron just highlighted, you know, brought on by the pandemic? Sure. Well, obviously, as Aaron alluded to, the pandemic has forced a lot of sacrifice on all of us. So the goal we were left with is how to create the greatest possible normalcy in the context of the situation we, we were in. Um, the decision we made early on is that while circumstances might push us online, we wanted to keep that structure of school consistent so that students had something to wake up for in the morning. Um, back in the springtime, our students attended classes on a similar daily schedule to the one we utilized during regular uh, school. The goal being to maintain a routine like Dr. Schessler described. Um, and, and the feedback we got was that that was very helpful for them. Um, the other thing we were trying to do in the springtime is not just pay attention to the academic progress, but also remember we're, we're teaching a whole person. And it was very important to us that we continue to teach that whole person in front of us. So we had virtual assemblies, speakers, award ceremonies. Uh, we continued our advisory program, which met every morning first thing. Uh, we created some variety uh, with career programming and guest speakers on Wednesdays. Uh, because we started to find that five days in a row of uh, watching classes on, TV, on on the computer was a bit too much for people, so it was a change in pace. Um, we're a Catholic school, so we also included some religious celebrations in there, um, all remotely and all virtually. But the goal in the spring was to replicate that whole person interaction. Um, coming into this year, we've we've made a commitment to maximizing normalcy again as much as we can. Uh, we started the year with all of our students in every day. Uh, during the winter surge, we were transitioning to about two to four days per week during which students could attend. Um, and then we've been back fully in person since mid-March. Um, but the key to our strategy was that in the fall, students who opted to be remote or who just happened to not be in that day um, were able to participate live in classes through video conferencing systems that we put into the classrooms. Um, this gave that sense of continuity and routine of being part of the classroom atmosphere so they didn't get detached from peers and such. Um, so throughout the year, every BG student had live instruction with their class every period, whether they were in school or not. Um, extracurriculars have stayed important. Um, our student athletes have been able to complete most of their seasons. Um, we've had concerts masked and socially distanced. We've had, uh, we had our NHS induction last week. We had our musical this past weekend. Um, assemblies where the whole student body joined in from their classrooms, um, things like that. 
So we've been able to keep some of those special traditions uh, going. So the answer to the question is we, we've certainly had to adjust some of the how, but the goal has been to maintain the what and the why as much as we possibly could um, in the interest of providing the greatest possible normalcy for our students. Um, and as Aaron alluded to, teachers and schools have picked up many new tools and strategies, technology and otherwise that are gonna serve us very well in the future. And I think we're gonna come out of this um, much better educators because of all of our experiences this past year. Absolutely, kudos to your school district. And it's it's great to hear, you know, that the goal was really to teach to the whole student and, and how they're learning and how they're, you know, what they need to, to thrive. And that really kind of speaks to what Dr. Chesler was saying earlier about making sure that students speak up and let them, you know, let teachers know what they need and, and knowing, hearing it from the academic point of view that yes, this is what we want from the students. So it's great dialogue to have. And I hope that we have some other high school viewers out there who are really taking to heart that these supports are put in place to really help them thrive and grow. So thank you for that. And Emily, you decided to take a gap year in between high school and college. And, you know, students who choose that typically will either travel or work or volunteer during that time. So what were you planning to do with your gap year? And how did COVID change that for you? Yeah, you know, COVID put me in a really tough position just because I have worked very hard to graduate early because I wanted to take my gap year, but I didn't want to take a gap year after my senior year because I didn't want to feel like left behind because my friends would have been going to college for their freshman year and I would have been on my gap year. So I ended up getting all my credits my junior year and I was so excited to go and travel. My plan was to go to Africa and I was going to be involved in a veterinary program. So what I was going to be doing is I was going to be a vet tech, which is basically a vet assistant and um, the specialty was working on big animals like elephants, rhinos, lions. So I was very excited for that. And I was really disappointed and frustrated that I couldn't do it just because I'd worked pretty hard to do it. And that was kind of my whole plan. So I really just felt like I didn't really know what to do now that it got shut down just because of COVID, um, you know, you can't travel. So what I ended up doing was um, I got a job in um, my town, raised some money for myself. And I also ended up finishing my gold award for Girl Scouts this year. And then lastly, um, I signed up for RVCC classes, um, which I recommend to everyone if you have a local college in your area to sign up for some of the classes because they're cheap, um, especially if you are still a high school student. It's really good to take a class like that because it's always beneficial. You're always going to learn something from it. And even if you end up not liking the class, it's still beneficial to yourself because when you figure out more of what you don't like, you get closer to figuring out what you do like. So that's something that I recommend to everyone. But um, I signed up for criminal justice classes and I absolutely love them. And um, it was a good spend of my time, I would say. That's excellent advice and, and congrats on your gold award. And Thank you know, you. this this is the second time we've had you on for Heads Up. And I'm thinking maybe the third time you might be like live from the safari or something zooming in with us. So I look forward to following your, your success, Emily. Thank you. So Eric, with students going back to school in person full time, they might feel anxious about potential COVID spread and their exposure. So how can students ease their anxiety and their parents' anxiety about going back to school and being around large groups of people? And what can they do to decrease their risk of contracting or spreading COVID-19? Sure. So I think uh, it's important to recognize when we're thinking about COVID-19 and other things that are, that are behaviors for us, we can't eliminate risk, but we can decrease it. Um, and so when we think about the different strategies that Jason put in in, in Bishop Girton High School and the other high schools kind of around the state and around the country, um, we wanna be able to figure out what are the most effective strategies to decrease that risk. And so for example, wearing masks is one of the first ones and the biggest ones that comes up. We talk about that in all of our school environments. Uh, we talk about that you know, out in public, in stores, in you know, restaurants, in you know, kind of movie theaters, things along those kind of lines. We talk about good hand hygiene, washing our hands, making sure we're disinfecting things. Uh, we talk about physical distancing. So actually, just since Aaron brought it up before, uh, we want to be able to have physical distancing, but you know, we still want social connectedness. So how do we make sure we get people connected and staying connected, even if we have some physical you know, kind of you know, barriers that we have to be able to work through from there? And the other thing that's important for us to recognize that the data in New Hampshire and in you know, kind of New England and you know, nationally and even internationally has been that schools in general haven't actually been where the spread has been for COVID-19. Uh, there has been some spread, some spread around school environments. So for example, sleepovers, parties, get-togethers, sporting events. So 
it's important for us to make sure that we want to do those risk reduction strategies in whatever activity we happen to be doing. So if you're going to have, you know, kind of a family over doing a barbecue outside is better than doing a party, you know, things along those kind of lines. So the, the, you know, different things that we can do to keep ourselves protected, but the actual spread within school when they do the different background checks and everything has been exceedingly minimal in New Hampshire and in New England, again, nationally. Um, and so that fits with the data that we've ended up seeing. So as we transition to, you know, more hybrid models or more in school models, um, we're cautiously optimistic that that will actually do very nicely. And if we can keep following those same risk reduction strategies, and especially if we can convince people to do more of that on their own and being careful outside of school environments, then we'll be able to make it that much more likely that our school environments will be successful and things will go well. Uh, I also wanna point out, I'm super excited that Aaron got his first vaccine, which is great. Um, and so the vaccine is approved for folks 16 and up. So, you know, there's Pfizer, Moderna, and Johnson & Johnson. Pfizer is approved down to the age of 16. The other two are approved starting at the age of 18. They are doing studies at the moment on kids 12 to 16. Uh, and so we may hear more about that a little bit as we get closer to the summer. Uh, and they are doing studies now on 6 to 12-year-olds. Um, but importantly, even with the vaccine, once you're vaccinated, we still have to follow those same risk reduction strategies. Um, so, you know, what we don't necessarily want is folks getting vaccinated and then all running outside, you know, running together into an indoor and thing, and we're going to immediately going to have a dance and nobody's masked and nobody's physically distanced at all. That that allows us to be, you know, kind of take a little bit more risk and slowly open things up, not necessarily wanting to do a big bang as the setup. So, you know, knowing what the risk reduction strategies are and then following through with what we can do to, to you know, make sure we keep each other safe. Yep, and those precautions are in place. We just need to continue to follow them. So thank you for that. Jason, what advice do you have that you give teachers and administrators and other school staff to help students with the transition back into the physical classroom after spending a year of remote or hybrid learning? Sure, so first off, I'd encourage staff and, and faculty not to be alarmed about the safety of returning in person. As Dr. Schessler mentioned, there's very little spread that we can trace to the classrooms. I'll speak a little bit to our own experience. Um, we've seen plenty of instances over the course of the year where we had a student who had COVID, they were in school, they might've been there for several days. And because masks were worn and we took precautions, the students who sat right next to them in class for several days didn't become positive with the, with the virus. Um, so if masks are worn and the distancing is, is put into place, our experience has been that it's very unlikely COVID will spread. Uh, we at BG have tracked about 60 cases in the school throughout the course of the year. Um, that's about the same rate as the broader community. So the, the rate in the school mirrored the rate in the community. It wasn't more or less risky. Um, the vast, vast majority of these came from family members and household contacts. So people at home, somebody in the family got it, the whole family got it, that type of thing. Only a few might, and we're really not sure about any one transmission at school, but a few might have been caught at school. Um, as Dr. Schausser said, it's been the social contact, sleepovers, gatherings, sporting events that have um, that have caused uh, some spread within our within our school community, but not the actual classes or the sports, all the things that go on around it. Um, you know, I think one thing for educational leaders to message is we still need our whole community to make sacrifices and take precautions, um, not just within the school. That it's a whole town, it's a city effort that everybody's got to dig deep in order to make in-person schooling a safe reality and to make it a priority and to make those sacrifices. If, if, if schooling is important, the whole community has to rally behind that because if there are lower cases in the community, there are lower cases coming into the school, there are fewer bullets we're having to dodge as, as educators and as students. And so in-person schooling and keeping kids in school is everybody's responsibility. Um, as for the anxiety of being back, I will say that this passes quickly. Um, educators and students can expect a couple moments in the first days back when you look around and you realize you're in a bigger crowd than you may have been in for the past year. Um, you know, the hallways will still get crowded. You can't, you can't turn that off when you have a full school building. We're pretty close to capacity. Um, so we have some busy hallways and full classrooms, but it does pass fast and, and you get comfortable. And in the end, the benefits of being back together, the social um, opportunities, in some cases, students have been in hybrid and they've been coming and going in different cohorts, that chance to see people you might not have seen for a couple months, um, those benefits all start to outweigh the anxiety pretty quickly. Um, and that's a good note for the school staff is not to underestimate the importance of this social connection that happens when the school reopens. Um, it's easy to focus on academics and how far behind you might be, but in a lot of ways, that social piece is just as important. 
Um, the last thing about anxiety is, is, is that realization, promoting this idea that we're all a little bit in control of this, that sometimes we get anxious about situations we can't control at all. Um, and we've tried to message throughout the year the sense of ownership for everybody that, that we, we have a, a phrase, COVID stops with a cardinal. Um, and basically the idea is if we all want to be in school together, um, every student in the school has a responsibility to be careful, to make sure that if they get sick, they stay home, um, to make sure that they're wearing masks so that if they do get COVID, COVID stops with them because they've taken the right precautions. Um, and we've messaged that with our families and our teachers, and they've really taken that seriously. Um, and the same is now true as we're encouraging everybody to get vaccinated as, as soon as they possibly can. Um, we're at about 95% of our faculty and, and a lot of our juniors and seniors are lining up now that they're eligible. Um, but, but the idea there is that we have some control and normalcy is something that we have to earn ourselves through how we respond to this. Um, and having that sense of control and that responsibility can be an antidote to the anxiety that we might feel about going back. Um, in reality, there are things that all of us can do to keep ourselves a little bit safer. And by focusing on those things rather than on these broader concerns that are out there, that can be a healthy approach to this. That's that's truly great advice. And I, I think it's excellent that you mentioned that keeping kids in school is really a community responsibility. And we can all do that by continuing to wear the masks. And like you and Dr. Schessler said, get the vaccine, you know, as soon as you're eligible for it. I was also so, going to point out, if you don't mind real quick, um, Jason sure. brought it up as a setup. It's a great life skill to learn how to deal with like there's a lot of adversity that, you know, students like Emily and Aaron have had to go through. Um, and there's a great deal of life experience that they've learned from this. So, you know, we all as adults and as professional learners and whatnot have had to figure out like, hey, how do I handle things a little bit differently? Um, and, you know, being able to learn coping strategies that help us get through the various things that we challenges that we run into uh, is really a valuable tool. And so, you know, my you know, younger kids respond a mirrored off how I do. You know, if I model the good coping skills and, and things that, you know, I can demonstrate, here's what I can do to control. I can't control everything, but I can control these things. And if I'm focused on those and great job for doing what you can um, really helps us, you know, as individuals, but also as a community, which is kind of a great skill for us all to have. The, there's a great metaphor. Um, if you think about the last pandemic of 1918, you think about a student who would have been a senior in high school then and think about all of the historic events that would have then occurred in their lifetime and all the triumph and adversity that they would have faced and the, the way the world changed over that, that, that course of the next 80 years, say. Um, if, if our students' lives are anywhere near as exciting as that, um, be, being able to cope with adversity is going to be a huge skill for them and something that, that we, we should celebrate. You know, this generation of students is going to come out of high school with having overcome real challenges that are different from anything anybody's faced in, in at least in my career, past 20 years um, and probably a lot longer. That's, that's an excellent point. And I think you're also touching upon something that John Broderick had said in the part one of this conversation, which was the youth these days, they're resilient. And they truly are. And I think Emily and Aaron have shared great examples of their resiliency and have helped, you know, others. So as we wrap up this conversation, you know, for both of you, Emily and Aaron, what advice do you have for graduating seniors or incoming freshmen as they take a new step in their lives after enduring this challenging year? So Emily, we'll start with you. I would say find something that you're passionate about and it doesn't have to be something stereotypical like let's say a sport that you like it can really be anything that you like something that worked for me this year was I found that I had a passion for caring for reptiles um, and that really just helped me relax and that's another thing I would say definitely relax understand that um, for like upcoming freshmen in college understand that colleges understand that this year has been difficult and um, meditating can always help fishing and I would also say look at COVID as more of a opportunity to focus on your mental health because during COVID you get to spend a lot more time with your family and by yourself figure out your needs as a person figure out how to set boundaries for yourself and maybe boundaries um, for those around you of how you want to be treated focus on yourself maybe go hiking um, something you can do is cut your hair um, quit nicotine i know a lot of um, high school students that's a huge thing um, vaping um, COVID is the perfect time uh, to quit and just make some changes in your life set some goals for what you want to do 
after COVID um, because this is not the first pandemic we've been through, it will end. Um, so set yourself up to be successful after COVID because it will end and you need to realize that it will end. Um, just think of how you wanna come out of COVID as basically like a new and improved version of yourself. And um, the last thing I would say is don't always look at the black and white in life. Sometimes you need to see the gray and you know, kind of just enjoy the gray. Don't always view things as such black and white. I love that. I would say that my piece of advice is get a schedule. Start a note, start noting what you're doing and write down what you're doing in your day, not only so you can plan ahead, but so you can look back on what you've accomplished. I think a huge part of this year has been, I haven't done much, but I'm also looking back and saying, I did a lot for the moment. I think I've kept my health in check, my physical body in check, and I've been able to accomplish just getting Bs. And I'm satisfied with that. If I have accomplished that, then I think I succeeded going through this pandemic. Hopefully it's my last one. I'll always be prepped now. Another thing I would say to almost repeating, set yourself up for success. Talk to your friends about what you're feeling. Talk to your family about what you're doing and see where you can grow. For incoming freshmen, I would say join maybe three clubs. And if one isn't working out, stick with the two. A part of growing as a human is seeing what you like, what you would enjoy to do to better the community and also to better yourself. For seniors leaving, I think a nice solid goodbye to your school would, would do us well. This year has been tough because a lot of us have almost lost prom, we lost homecoming, uh, winter carnival, all of the senior nights, the games, we've lost a lot, but I think we're able to reflect on at least we got something. We're lucky that we were in school that we got an education this year. And I think that in itself is a great part. And I think uh, you, Aaron and Emily are two truly great examples of, of how far you've grown and, and come through this um, since we first met you when we first launched our Heads Up series. So thank you for continuing on by focusing on your mental health and by focusing on what you could change. So thank you for sharing your advice. Um, and also to you, Jason and Dr. Schessler, to have all four of you on this panel has been truly wonderful. And thank you for all of your advice. I appreciate it. Of thank course. You. Thank you for having us. Yeah. Thank you for having me. And I actually had one more thing. It just like popped into my head. Um, the last piece of advice that I would have for seniors who are thinking about going to college, college is always a great option for people. But if you don't feel ready, like I didn't feel ready, take a gap year. You know, there's, there's always time to go back to college and, you know, don't stretch out the gap year too long because a lot of people, what happens is they'll take a gap year. They get caught up in making some temporary money when you're young, but you don't realize that that's not the money you want to be making for the rest of your life. And that's not the job you want to be doing for the rest of your life, but it's always okay to, you know, like relax, take a step back. You don't have to do everything that your friends are doing. Take a gap year, take some time for yourself, figure out, you know, what you really like to do, figure out your passion before you go to college, because you don't want to go to college and end up just, you know, like wasting your time. And it's always okay to go into college, not knowing what you want to do. But for some people, they're just not ready to go into college right after high school, especially during this time. And that is completely okay. I know there's a huge pressure to go to college right away, but you really don't have to, you can still be successful if you do take a gap year. That's great advice. I think you mentioned it earlier about we're not living in black and white anymore. We're living in that gray area and that might be people's gray area that's worth exploring. So thank you for that. Exactly. You can just learn so much about yourself and the world through taking a gap year before you're emerged into the college life. Yep. Excellent. Well, we look forward to catching up with both of you again, Aaron and Emily and Dr. Schessler and Jason. Thank you so much, everyone. Take care. Stay healthy and stay safe.